Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Cybersecurity Career Talks. We are going to talk about how to start a career in privacy and uh, data protection. And uh, I have with me two speakers who come from the land of GDPR, that is Brussels in Belgium. And uh, my first speaker is uh, George Ataya. He is a professor who teaches about uh, privacy and data protection as well as a pro practitioner. Uh, my second speaker today is uh, Puneet Bhatia, and Puneet is again based in uh, in, in Brussels, and uh, he is someone that can help you with your career if you are planning to launch a career in uh, data protection. He is a privacy uh, pro practitioner as well as he helps people transition into data protection and privacy careers. Uh, before we start. Let me start with uh, a short disclaimer. The views expressed in this presentation and during this session are the personal opinions of the participants and do not reflect the official policy or position of their respective employers. This discussion is a volunteer led effort to contribute to the profession and pay forward the many kindnesses and instances of support and guidance the participants have received during the course of their career. Thank you so much. Okay, so George, let's start with you. What is privacy and why are we concerned about it? How has it become relevant right now? Yeah, well, uh, Nele, for thank you for being here. First of all, I'm delighted to be here with, uh, as well with a prestigious expert in Belgium, Mr. Pat Batia. So uh, actually, uh, uh, privacy depends on the country where you are. Uh, it is uh, with GDPR, we had uh, a kind of small revolution in Europe where we had to start from a date or another to uh, get the re major requirements on organizations. Imagine how huge it is for uh, SME to uh, apply, uh, to, to, to adhere to, uh, to, to GDPR regulations with all its articles, with all its requirements, uh, with all the uh, 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 rights for um, uh, data uh, subjects. Um, privacy in different countries is not similar uh, because uh, when we talk about the privacy in countries where the law is not enforced, I was in, I remember in Beijing, uh, China, uh, a few years ago, exactly at the time where uh, uh, the GDPR was voted in Europe, and uh, it, it was they also were talking in the in, in the in the magazines on uh, in their uh, newspaper on in relation to uh, some regulations. But when we we look at what it is exactly, it has nothing to do what we call privacy. So it really depends on the perspective, the culture uh, of the country and the ethics of that country. Um, when, when we talk about privacy, for me, um, while security, information security and cybersecurity is protecting us from the others, uh, privacy is for me uh, protecting the others from us, protecting the others, those people who, for, for, for whom we hold uh, personal information, protecting them from our bad doing, our uh, disclosing of their data when uh, we should not. So this is, in my opinion, what privacy is. But behind privacy, there are so many activities uh, where professionals today can very much help and support organizations to guide them into uh, being compliant. Thank you so much. And uh, Puneet, do you, what do you have to add to that? Why is it so relevant? Why is privacy so relevant? I think first and foremost, thanks Nilofar for having me and it's a great privilege and an honor to be with two experts, one from my country and in my field and another very closely related from cybersecurity. So thank you for having me. I mean, privacy as uh, George put it very rightly, it's our choice about what we share and with who. So it's, we have the, these days digital footprint. That means we are known by the data we carry along, our name, age, identity, and so on. And who do we give it and who do we not give it and what purpose do we share it with? That protecting that, ensuring that that remains for that purpose for which we shared is called privacy. So I, and it, the definition of course changes, varies based on law, based on culture and so on. But essentially it's protecting your self your digital identity. Sure, thank you so much. 
so how come all of a sudden or at least it feels to me that way uh, george uh, w- what is it like uh, which uh, made people wake up and take uh, notice of privacy and privacy regulations uh, once gdpr was launched and now with the covid situation everybody is interested in protecting customers privacy and uh, uh, people are like more woke about it so so what's going on why is it so now well uh, it all started uh, something like 10 years ago when uh, many european members of parliament identified the risk of having the data of uh, european subjects uh, used by large corporations and we can uh, cite the big names as uh, manipulating or using those uh, uh, the, the data the personal data of uh, european citizen in uh, commercial for commercial reasons and that could lead to a use of data in uh, um, in ways that are not acceptable to the european culture as a result they started to work on uh, the regulation the regulation the regulation took something like uh, three to four years to be concluded when i talk to people uh, who have been very much involved every day to develop and conclude on the on the law on the 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 the, 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 the articles the, the various articles every single articles took a lot of time because can you imagine Uh, you, we need the consensus of uh, uh, all the countries or european countries all the representatives of the countries in addition to that some anecdotes uh, whenever everything was settled and they agreed on a form some major names that i will not c- cite here uh, owners of major co- co- corporation worldwide said no 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 we cannot accept that we have to to you have to change that article because we cannot live with that as a result it took another uh, few months to change that article again and make it acceptable to large corporation in order for them to play the game so it is it was quite uh, important struggle um, and um, that struggle uh, ma- managed to be implemented thanks to the uh, m- a model of regulation european regulation where it should not be translated into law a european regula- regulation is implemented from the day that it is voted and they gave two years to co- co- corporations from 2016 to 2019 as a result from 2019 may uh, every organization in every company or corporation in uh, in europe including public services were required to apply uh, privacy as a result some corporation handle much more personal data set than some other corporation obviously when the organization is b2b it does not have as much Uh, uh personal data but if you are a bank or if you are a telecom and if that telecom or that bank or even a retail uh is handling a lot of data and i know what what my wife purchased from that retail and what i and she knows what i purchased from that retail where well, we have to to ensure that that data is private because uh, it is uh, the ownership of the person in, himself as a result of having that privacy from a day to another being imposed if i may say on organization we had to structure differently the processes in organization the information security the 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 way we leg- uh, we legally uh, uh, adjust and work and process the data uh, the way we handle uh, and and we uh, market and we sell every process every major process in an organization had to be adapted and we had to go through uh, uh, quite some heavy risk assessment methods in order to ensure that we are not uh, going against any major article of gdpr sure thanks and uh, when we are talking about uh, gdpr and now that the dust has settled um, i'm seeing a lot of like in the us i'm seeing a lot of uh, privacy officer uh, positions open up um, i mean a lot of companies require that so are there any enforcement enforcement actions what is leading to this need for uh, privacy officer positions and roles in the us uh, has there been any kind of like fines which are coming out and why is everybody taking notice of this today question to me or to mr batia both so punit can go first and then punit you can, can uh, join and yeah sure so there's certainly been uh, enforcement actions uh i think there are about 270 plus uh enforcement actions that have taken place some of them are 100 million plus and most of them are less than that so people like to see the big ticket items and that's what they remember but if you go to enforcementtracker.com then you can find a lot of companies have been fined 
And the need that is coming on in the US or outside of Europe is for two factors. One, any company that is providing services to citizens or residents in EU. So essentially, if we talk about Facebook or Google or any other digital provider, they are serving the market in EU. They need to comply with GDPR. And then there are two kinds of roles in which they need to fulfill that requirement. One is having a data protection officer, which is a requirement when they are processing significant amount of data. But even if they are providing services and there's a question that EU resident have, then they need to have an EU representative. So somebody in EU who represents them, kind of interacts, engages with the data subjects or individuals or customers on, on the ground. And those two requirements are driving this traction this action saying ah, there is GDPR or there is privacy we need to comply with. And then the complication is most of these companies are global. And then they rather than having a US or a EU approach, they like to have a global or a broader approach saying, let's address this privacy challenge one time rather than saying, now we do it for EU later on, we will look at US and then, because everybody is coming up with the law. In last five years, about 140 plus countries have come up with a privacy law. Of course, it's driven and triggered by the GDPR, as uh, uh, George explained. But then a lot of countries have come up. I mean, India has a draft. The Brazilian legislation would come into effect next year. See, we have CCPA, the California Consumer Protection Act. We also have an act in Washington, in New York, Illinois. So they are thinking of it. So a lot of Europe, uh, US states are also coming up. So privacy, as it becomes important, companies are thinking, let's handle it one time rather than having to change and adapt every time. So that's driving this requirement or demand for privacy careers or privacy roles. Sure, thanks. And George, uh, what, what is your opinion? Well, yes, actually, uh, this is uh, opening many opportunities for uh, cybersecurity experts to jump on the bandwagon and offer those services. Though, in my opinion, uh, that we have to identify for those organizations, those countries uh, that are located in countries where there is no specific explicit law so far, we, I'm sure that there are a lot of opportunities for cybersecurity experts to offer services where we do not have to invest twice into cybersecurity today, into privacy tomorrow, where we can take advantage of documenting implemented controls, uh, documenting privacy controls that anyhow we have to put in place and be prepared for the future law where we will show that we have all what is required and our organization is compliant. So I think we can serve a lot of corporation or a lot of organization by helping them prepare today already, even if the law is not in, in, in effect in various states or various countries. Sure, thank you so much. So what is the role of a privacy professional in an organization? Because um, mostly like uh, so far, uh, people from compliance, people from legal departments have uh, joined in and taken care of like pri privacy requirements. So if there is a question, like usually you would look at people from legal or compliance for answers. And now it is like evolving into, uh, not now, but it's it's uh, evolving into a uh, subject of, all by itself, somebody who is going to uh, department, which is going to take care of privacy of our customers. So what is the role? What, what, what kind of role does a privacy professional pay, play in an organization? And what does, what does that individual do? So essentially, if we put it in one line, it is about privacy compliance and it is about ensuring that the company is compliant with the law. But what does it entail? It entails four different dimensions. One is the definition because we talked about, you need to look at which area you're operating in, what laws operate, and then you need to create a definition around what is the policy that you're going to follow in that company? What are the requirements you will comply with? You need to define a control framework and make an inventory of different processing activity that go in the company. Second is advisory role. So, so if on one hand you define, on the other hand you advise. Advise meaning if a business wants to launch new products or start an activity into new area, or let's say wants to acquire a new company, then the privacy officer has to give his or her opinion around different aspects on data protection. How will data stay protected or not, or if there are any additional controls to be put in place. Similarly, if 
you want to transfer data between one entity and another entity, or you want to have another service provider exchange. So there's something called a data processing agreement or data processing transfer agreement. So there the privacy officer has to weigh in. And if you want to start a completely new activity, say market into a new dimension or market different kind of product to existing customers, then comes something called a data protection impact assessment. So there is an advisory role as well. And then the third dimension is because if you are defining and advising, you need to monitor as well. That's kind of compliance saying, did the definitions I set forth, did the controls I put in place get implemented? Are they being done on the ground as I expected? So there's a monitoring aspect of it wherein the privacy officer looks at the compliance dimension, the documentation dimension, and also we are in the cyber security or security world. So sometimes incidents also happen. So you need to weigh in on that. So you need to stay on top of that. And the, another fourth dimension is there is staff. And we always say most of the breaches happen when staff is not informed. So you need to make sure staff, executives, management, everybody is informed about what is their role? What do they need to do? So it's essentially giving them trainings, giving them awareness around different aspects of privacy. So definition, advisory, monitoring, and training. So those are the four dimensions in which a privacy officer operates. Okay, thank you so much. And George, uh, are we now moving away from just being compliant with the law to leading with privacy as a benefit or as a feature for uh, products that we sell? And uh, what, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, absolutely. Today, organizations have to show not only that they are compliant with the law, and, um, uh, and I will mention in, in a minute why sh they should anyhow, but they are also using privacy as they have used security and cybersecurity in the past as a competitive advantage. We cannot afford not having um, a compliance, but we can also show our clients that we go one step further, that not only we protect that da their data, but we do everything to ensure that we are secure. We get certified. We ensure that our activity is going whenever we need, whenever possible, uh, to offer additional uh, uh, services related to that compliance. What I would like to mention in relation to not uh, to, to the to the uh, put potential damage to organization that is not compliant or that may have some incidents that can be um, um, uh, advertised. It is important to know, first of all, that uh, the GDPR law uh, and most of uh, the laws worldwide are imposing fines on organizations that do not comply. And fines can be very, very harsh. So the issue is, um, and I remember I was speaking with uh, uh, um, our minister in charge of, uh, of that uh, domain, uh, a good friend of uh, Mr. Batia, by the way. And um, I, uh, I said to him uh, on a conference, we were speaking together on a conference, and um, I said to him, uh, you know what, I, uh, I'm, I'm really not very much concerned with you, Mr. The Minister, and your, the fines that you will be imposing on me. He looked at me and he said, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, because it's too late. He said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, because the reputation damage is much harsher and much more, much worse than any fine that we are going to, to pay. So uh, uh, be confident that whatever uh, 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 fines we are going to have, uh, the reputation damage and more than reputation damage, the operational damage. Because if we have had an incident and if we are required uh, for the law to uh, recover, to repair, to uh, uh, um, pay back, or to at least inform all those people who have been uh, damaged, then it may be a huge amount, probably even higher than the, the fine and, uh, uh, and as important probably as the damage, reputational damage. Sure, thank you so much. So an another aspect of this is that there is a data breach, right? And uh, back in the day, it used to just remain a data breach. But what we are seeing now is 
that a data breach is now translating into a breach of privacy because people are like saying, okay, uh, in case of ransomware attacks, et cetera, that we are going to post this publicly. We are going to dox all these documents. So now we are bringing more complexity into cybersecurity where both of the two things have to play together. Uh, I am now convinced, like I, whatever you told me, I am like, I want to start a career in, in privacy and data protection. So are there any kind of industries which require this or can you can you elaborate like who would hire me? George, you want to go first? Yeah, well, sure, by all means, thank you very much. Uh, well, um, I think it is essential that we identify those sectors, those industries, those sectors of activities that require, that are dealing with personal data and in locations where there is no effective law, at least a strict law, we have to identify what is the competitive advantage of those organizations who can voice, who can advertise their respect to personal data and to privacy, personal data protection and privacy. In those situations, what I would advise is that we uh, identify what is the value proposition that that industry or that organization is offering to its client and how can we promote and talk to senior management of those organizations, presenting to them that at a cheap cost, we can bring to them that advantage, that value, and they can promote it, they can advertise it and let them start with it and associate their name, then uh, having their competitor associating its name with uh, with the privacy. I give always an example that happened in Europe with the car industry. In the, in the years 90s, Volvo car uh, advertised very much security. And everybody used to have, uh, uh, used to, when they talk about Volvo cars, for them, that's a secure car. And yet, uh, test after test, um, I was talking with uh, the CIO of uh, Renault at that time, the French company Renault, and he said to me, George, you cannot believe it, but uh, from the testing and benchmark point of view, we are the first in the world. I said, then why don't you advertise it? He said to me, useless, because we are not the first on the market, and whatever we do, they will say, oh, yeah, they are trying to do it like Volvo. They, and so, so it will be promoting most, more Volvo than us if you are promoting security and, and uh, in cars. So here, again, the same. The value proposition to your client is to say to them, be the first in your industry to be leading in that domain as well as leading in cybersecurity, as well as leading in overall security, privacy, protection, and compliance. And I think when, while 10 years ago, this they didn't have a lot of value, today we cannot conceive many industries, not only the banking, not only FinTech, but many organizations, many industries cannot afford today not being, uh, showing, uh, displaying a security uh, image. Sure, thanks. And, uh... Uh, I mean, I've, I've worked with uh, Renault Nissan on a few projects, so I'm aware of what you're saying. Um, coming back to like Puneet, so I have, I have like, I have work experience. How do I take that? I've got like other certifications, et cetera. Maybe I don't, right? I want to start a career in privacy and data protection. What do I do next? I think there are three steps the way you should look at your career, especially for those who have experience, even those who don't have experience still, you have a history that is 15 years, 10 years, 20 years of experience, or even if you are coming out of college, you have some history. So you need to look at that history and find out what are the skills that you can have relevant for privacy. So that's called leverage. So leverage what you have done in the past, if you're in cybersecurity or in law or in IT, wherever you've been, you can leverage those skills. Second is learn. So while you're leveraging on what you have done in the past, you need to learn something new. That is understand the privacy law and understand some of the certification. Then find out which certification works for you and do that one. There are a lot of certifications. Some are for management. Some are for demonstration that you do. You are expert in privacy and some are that you are an expert in privacy from a technology standpoint or a security stand. So you pick the right certification and in combination of that then you identify where do you want to launch yourself which jobs 
because when we talk about privacy, typically people think of that it's about being a DPO, data protection officer. But there are other roles like there's a privacy analyst role which is coming up. There's something called privacy officer or privacy and protection officer. There's a DPO and DPO also has a meaning, DPO in the company or DPO towards the regulator. And without complexifying further, there's also something called a privacy consultant. So people like George and me, when we say we are practitioner, when we work for a client, then maybe we are playing the role of a DPO, but sometimes we are only playing the role of a consultant. So there are many roles that you can play and you need to pick. And even there's the project or program manager for data protection. So you need to know what you are going to do in that stack, map the certification, leverage your skills, and then launch yourselves. So leverage what you have done, learn what you need to do, and learn about the privacy profession and privacy, of course, and the basis, and then launch yourself. And you can do it in many ways. One of the ideas is uh, having been to this talk, people will think they can read books and do it. That's one idea. Second, people like me and George or even other universities provide certifications and courses. There's also coaching that we provide. So coaching is basically helping you with the steps while you do what we tell you. And the third option is a hybrid option. You do some online courses and mix with what you can do and what you can get from the coach. So that's how you would launch a privacy career and that's how you will identify what you can do and where you can do something. Sure. And George, uh, what do you think? How do well, I yes. launch? Yes. Very much agree with uh, what Punit mentioned. Actually, uh, we have to leverage the existing skills and we have to get support if necessary. Probably what, uh, what I would advise uh, Puni to, to do is to make available some, uh, uh, some, some assistance, some uh, material, some templates, uh, some guidance. So uh, the people listening to this uh, video will be able to uh, take advantage of what is already available and offer those services. As I as, as, uh, mentioned uh, earlier, there are existing knowledge of uh, information security, of risk management, of business transformation. Actually, for your information, Nilofer, we have identified the five domains of knowledge that are required to become an expert. If you allow me, I would be happy to share the screen and show those uh, five domains if it is possible to share the screen. Okay, let me help you. And those domains have been identified uh, in the cooperation with the, uh, uh, our D data protection authority. And we have identified those domains that are necessary for experts to be able to respond to the various requirements that are necessary. So- um, George, you can share yes. your screen. Thank you very much. I'll do it now. So um, here it is. Um, I suppose you can see my screen now. We have identified five domains of knowledge. The first one is the one related to uh, knowing, understanding the law and identifying what are the requirements of our business. The second one is related to how to assess the risk now that we know what is required. How can we do impact assessment? How can we identify the risk that we have today in our current way of working? And what are the action plans that we have to put in place? The third one is related to the compliance transformation. I, 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 I actually invented the word from digital transformation to compliance transformation, where we talk about implementing all those processes, projects, programs, changes, contracts, awareness, all those activities that are required in order for our organization to adjust itself, adjust its processes, adjust its behavior, and adjust its, its relationship with client. The fourth domain is related to information security and data protection technology. And the last domain is related to once we have built everything related to the operations, to running, to responding to incidents, to ma breaching, breach management. So although those five domains may seem at, in some occasions contradictory one with each other. And we have identified for all those students that are lectured by Punit and myself, we have identified that those sometimes cannot conceive being uh, able to do number one and number four, number two and number five simultaneously because it requires something different in your mind and, in, and the way you, you think. So we have identified those five domains and it is essential for a compliance professional to identify, to privacy profession, to identify what are from those five domains 
what is missing uh, me in order for me to be able to deliver those services. And it is important for them to build that knowledge and, and understand that we, they have to uh, master it, not from the technological point of view, not only from the security point of view, domain four, not only, only from the transformational point of view, domain three, not only from the risk management and operation breach management number two and five, but also understanding the law and most important, which is most of the time neglected by our technical people, is understanding what are our organization requirement, what is essential, what is what our CEO, our client CEO should understand, should put as focus, should determine as an essential principle that we have to align with in our organization. And based on that, everything can come afterwards. And based on that, all the in privacy project program plan could be implemented in organization. So there is a huge challenge to our experts today to adjust their skills in order for them to be able to uh, become privacy professions. But that is not very difficult at all. Everything is at grab when we talk at two professionals in information security, professions in digital transformation. Thanks. Um, so, so, so thanks, George, for sharing these five domains. And, and uh, this really explains a lot because now I can see visually uh, what, where I am what, and where are the gaps that I need to um, fulfill. Another thing this showed me was that the fifth domain, it means like even if you are in the business, right, you are in the operation side of things, uh, then you can like uh, maybe like leverage all the other things and uh, transform your role um, in, in, and add value by uh, talking about like privacy or uh, data protection things. Um, based on what you showed me, I could have like, when we talk about privacy, we talk about like external compliance, right? But now what, uh, this tells me that there is a lot of things which are internal, right? So suppose we are launching something, a new product or whatever. We as, as, as like uh, privacy professionals probably have to ask these questions. Okay, what, are, what data are we sharing about our customers? What are we using? What kind of like information we are leveraging, right? So. This role is as much as it is an external role. I think it's like an internal facing role also, right? Where we are uh, talking about processing the data of our, of our customers and um, probably using it. Can you talk, Puneet, can you talk about like uh, a few certifications in this area and uh, what are nice to have? Well, there are, we have to look back when security or compliance came in about 15, 20 years ago we used, did not have a very mature market and there were a very few certifications available. While if you look at it now, the market has matured and the certification arena has matured. So that's the same with privacy. We are in the early stage. There are a few certifications. The leading ones are from the International Association of Privacy Professionals. So there's the CIPM, CIPT, CIPPE, CIPP US, and even Asia now. So that's one set of certifications which are known very recently, ISACA, the COVID, which led to COVID, has also come up with certified information, uh, I think, solutions engineer and other certification. They are coming up with practitioner certification. There's also an organization called Exin in uh, Netherlands, which, and then we have the universities like uh, uh, George talked about in Solvay when we teach students. We have our own course on data protection. There's other universities without giving them branding. I think there are other universities and also other certifications. But certifications is one part of it. Certification means you know it. But when you are in front of an employer, you need to demonstrate that. And that's why it's not just the certification which will get you a job. It's also the other thing. Because when the market is not so mature, it's possible that you go and get a certification. But Believe me, if somebody with 15 to 20 years of experience in IT or cybersecurity does a certification, vis-a-vis -vis the same certification is done by a college pass out, say in law or any other dimension or any other uh, uh, career, it has a different value. The employer would look at it differently because you bring in corporate knowledge, you bring in experience and how things are managed. So certification at this moment, you can get them 
So the bar entry level bar is low, but the more important aspect is what you do with it and what skills you bring along with it. Sure. And uh, um, say you've talked about all these training um, that you and George are doing. Um, how, how does that that help? How, suppose I'm like starting off, I'm like new in um, say privacy or maybe from other domains, I'm trying to like uh, make a career or launch my career in privacy and data protection. It's not like I want to do like a Three three day course and then you know like go and try and try for jobs. But but what I'm trying to do is uh, work towards uh, more uh, make my basis make a foundation. Uh, how 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 does like courses that you are talking about help me and where do they take me? Like do they take me like show me how things are done or wh what value can they they add? I think it. We both will probably add uh, because this is a question which George would have a lot to say. And if he says that, then I won't have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if I may start, uh, I think certification is one part of it, as I said, and each certification, it goes good and bad. So same is true for each training. So if you are doing a training, which is aimed at delivering you a certification, you'll get the certification. And if you're going to a university and getting a course, like the five more, uh, 5D approach that George shared, you get a comprehensive view on the data protection. But all along, you also need some scenarios, some practical guidance, case studies, and so on. So that's what is the differentiation. And I don't say one is bad or the other. Each one of them have different objectives. But if you're looking for a privacy career, you need to look at something which gives you a certification, gives you practical knowledge, and also allows you to have practical experiences through case studies and other things. Most of the courses that George or I run, they emphasize on all three dimensions, but I let George add on to it. Yeah, it's simply, I wanted to add Puni, to what you are saying is that to be credible, I think you, sh you have to associate your name with uh, something that exists already. So in my opinion, I would, uh, as an outsider, I would invite both of you to see how can you promote uh, those good practices? How can you make access all those adequate methods and practices and names and credibility on the market and the experience of a European market that is uh, mature in that domain. How could, can you bring that into other organizations? How can you make available to people who are listening to us uh, uh, those methods and that name and that credibility so you, they do not have to start from scratch because there are ten thousands, tens of thousands of people certified from AIPP or from Isaac or from the others. The issue is not that. The is, issue is that I need to serve my organization, my client or my internal, my, my, my employer, and I need to serve them adequately. Because as for cybersecurity, and I have been in the domain of cybersecurity because I was advisor to the European uh, um, Commission in the 90s already in the domain of security, uh, by coincidence, representing Isaac in that in that uh, on that time, um, there are so many ways to spend a lot of money on implementing protection that is not required on uh, conducting risk assessment with wrong conclusions because we are not uh, 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 seasoned ex expert in that domain. I think to be credible towards an employer, it is essential that we associate our name with uh, uh, existing expertise with existing market like the European market where we have been through all that and try to bring to the, the our expert, our audience, those uh, practices, those templates, those models, and how to, for example, um, simply to conduct uh, the, 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 the privacy impact assessment, simply to identify and inventory the processes and go through those and identify which one of those requires what uh, implementation to be uh, compliant with GDPR, simply to, uh, to identify and inventory the data that we have, the personal data that we are sitting on, and which one of those is processed in an adequate way or not, simply by identifying which instance of my database is residing where, with which supplier, and when is it processed, and how much I have a liability because it is processed, I'm giving some examples now, but all those cannot be invented from day to another. All those are practices that we have to go through very professionally to ensure our employer, to give insurance to our uh, client, 
that we are doing it adequately and that we are focusing on what is essential that when we, once we are spending 20 days or 120 days into implementing compliance, we are bringing the, the most out of it. Right, and if I may add an example on that, I was talking to a couple of students a few days ago as part of my coaching. And what happens is these are students in law, they've done privacy or IP, privacy and IP law. But what they know is all the terms that George is talking about. They know there's a data inventory, there's a privacy statement, there's a data protection impact assessment, and they know all the theory about it. But when you ask them to write a privacy statement, conduct a data protection impact assessment, then they struggle. And that's where the role of a practical coach or a course comes along. And that's what we bring in when George and me talk about, we help them with these practical experiences apart from gaining those academic or theoretical aspects around it, saying, this is data protection impact assessment, this is how you do it. But when you get in front of 10 people and there's a marketing manager telling you, no, I don't want to do it. That's when the fun starts. And those are the practical experiences that you need to look at when you're looking at courses or uh, coaching. Sure, thank you so much. Um, what I've noticed is that uh, like in the last like five years, people were not like, there are not many roles separately call, available in the US market, but now that is picking up. And that's why like I brought both of you here to talk about how a person could uh, get into a, a, a role like focused on privacy. Um, when we are talking about uh, like a specific role, right? When we talk about like a privacy role, uh, what do you what do you recommend? Like like people uh, from say maybe IT domain or people from is there is there like a particular niche that is more apt at this? Maybe from uh, internal audit or people who got like risk and compliance background, or can anybody learn? acquire, like you said, right? Like leverage, learn, and then like uh, uh, probably like uh, study towards like certain certifications on based on what they're trying to do. Can you ad advise someone today who's like listening to us? Um, who, which pathways are available and is there particular path or can anybody who's like set their mind on doing something um, like go through this process and um, launch a successful data privacy? Good. Yeah, actually, I would like to uh, present again a screen that will show you uh, when we look at those people attending our executive education at our business school, um, we, we see that on the right part, you have so many people involved directly or indirectly with uh, privacy. Those are people that are active in privacy because they are required by their organization and because or because they are required as a service that I deliver. So we see that uh, we talk a lot about the data protection officer, for example, um, but we forget before last one, the process owner, because at the end of the day, the ultimately responsible person is the CEO and the owner of the process. I'm a human resources manager in a large corporation. Well, I'm owning the process of dealing with many data, uh, 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 personal data, and I'm responsible to protect that personal data. So we talk about process owners, we talk about project managers, we talk about legal counsel, lawyer, etc. Now, the skills that I have mentioned in, uh, previously, those five major skills that are required, imply that many people can become expert in privacy, or many people can, even if they are not uh, necessarily uh, auditor or uh, information security professional or uh, data management expert or process expert, they can become responsible when, within organizations in managing data because they are simply responsible for the process. So the question is everybody on a day, one a day or on, on one day or another day will be required to deal with personal data and will be required to implement adequately privacy. And the issue is, should you be interested into getting into that domain? Should you be interested to position your career internally or externally towards your uh, client as a, a, a privacy compliant, a privacy uh, expert, I'm sorry, privacy consultant, then in my opinion, you should ensure that first, first you have understood what is privacy, what, how privacy um, 
is or could be implemented in a specific organization and ensure that you have identified those different steps, those different activities that are necessary for that organization so you can start helping them. It is obvious that people who have basics in compliance, in risk management, in process management, in digital transformation, in uh, incident handling, obviously in legal, obviously in IT, in any domain, are uh, prepared to get into that activity. So what is uh, uh, remaining to them is to identify what is missing me so I will be proposing my services as an expert in the privacy. Sure, thank you. And uh, now we are like uh, coming to the end of our live stream right now. This was great information, but what does somebody do if they, they need to get in touch with both of you? And um, I think you've prepared, Puneet, you've prepared something, right, for our uh, viewers today. Um, GDPR on a page, how do they get access to that? So there's a URL called tiny.cc. I will, I will put that in. I and you can put that. put that on the YouTube. Yes. So basically, T I N Y dot C C. I try to simplify, shorten the URL slash yes. June 27, all in small caps. So that's the date of today. I've, if I've they shared put it. that. They give their name and email, and we send them a GDPR on a page because GDPR sometimes can be overwhelming for people with a lot of requirements and complexity. So we put GDPR on into 12 different blocks, which they can understand and refer back if they are preparing for it, if they are working on a job or something saying, what area does it belong to? And then they deep dive into that. And again, George and me consistently work on, and I think you are also working on coaching, guiding people. So what we can do is if they want to get in touch, they can ask us. And when we launch a course, I'm working on creating some online courses George already has a course which is in person on uh, the data privacy in uh, the university. So we can give them insights, information on that as well. So if they log in or just give their name and email, we will keep them updated on what's happening. I would like to add, if you allow me, Nilofer, that uh, do not forget that in whatever market you are in today, if you are not located in Europe, you have a huge opportunity because many organizations, many companies are offering services to Europeans. And as Mr. Batia mentioned earlier, you are required when working with European subjects, when dealing with data belonging to European subjects, you are required to, have to implement GDPR. So every organization in the United States, whatever in Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, outside Europe, I'm sorry, that is dealing with European subject data is required to be compliant with GDPR. So I invite all of you attending this, this uh, video to identify organization around you that are working with Europe and see how can they benefit from what Mr. Batia mentioned as tools, uh, information that they can make available to their client so they can offer that opportunity that is easily accessible at that time. You should not come to Europe in order for you to have access to a DPO or an expert in GDPR. So, George, um, uh, are there any specific career-related sites for privacy experts? Like, are there any job sites uh, which are available, which are like um, displaying only um, privacy-related uh, careers? For the time being, uh, I'm uh, involved mainly in uh, Europe and in Belgian markets. So I have a site that is uh, called the DPO Circle, but it's limited only to Belgian nationals. Uh, but um, I'm convinced that there are so many uh, 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 sites that are available. Uh, I invite everybody to get into the, uh, uh, the, the, the official sites of data protection authorities. For example, the European Data Protection Board. If you look at European Data Protection Board, uh, you will see all the publications of, of the European Data Protection Board, which is the overall European authority. That is a combination that is the association of the, of the national authorities and that publish on a regular basis information and uh, directives related to guidance related to uh, the implementation of GDPR. But I think I would more rely on, on information that is provided, for example, by, by Punit Bhatia, where you have a, a focus on all those useful information that are directly useful by everybody. Because if you are not a lawyer, and if you are not specialized into uh, legal 
aspects of data protection, I would rather rely on professional pages like the one that is mentioned earlier. Sure, thank you so much. So next week is 4th of July and we will not have a live stream on that day. Um, it's like uh, the uh, birthday of the US independence. So we will skip that Saturday and we will meet um, on, on the day, um, the week after that, which is the 11th. And I look forward to having everybody back again here with another episode of Cybersecurity Career Talks. Thank you so much for joining.